Thank you. Thank you. It's, uh, boy, it's, uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here. Can, can you hear me back there in the cheap seats? This thing's working okay? All right, great. All righty. Um, really, where I'd, where I'd like to start tonight, if, if, actually, first of all, um, I, I'd like to thank Cody and Robin for helping put this thing together. I mean, this, this, is, uh, this is no small thing. It's, it's substantial. And uh, you did a marvelous job of creating a... A set here of the vision that George Bush has for America. Yeah, it's, 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 uh, yeah. How the electric sheep dream, you know. It's, uh, oh my. If we're going to take back America, I think one of, the, one of the first things that we have to ask ourselves is what are we going to take it back to? Uh, I think the from is, is becoming increasingly evident. Um, but but the you know it, it, it implies that there was that there was some sort of a vision that there was something that perhaps we've lost that there was a an understanding a meaning a a a a, um, a power a vitality uh, a morality a, a morality a, a high a high ideal that has been uh, somehow. Certainly not. You know, lost is just way too strong a word, but is 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 under assault, let's say. And uh, for me, d- discovering that has been a, a a long and fascinating process. And and some of the most significant of my discoveries, and I and I you know I thought I understood about American government and about you know politics and democracy and things and. And, and those of you who listen to the radio show, you know, I've had a kind of varied, uh, I mean, in 1963, when I was 12 years old, I read None Dare Call It Treason by John Stormer, you know, the book about the communists and the State Department. And I knew they were coming to get us. And in 64, I went door to door for Barry Goldwater, because, you know, it's a... Um, and by 67, I was being arrested in East Lansing in the middle of an anti-war protest, you know, it's like, and, and had joined the Students for Democratic Society. So it's, you know, I, I've, and, but, but what, what I hadn't, and, 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 and of course, you know, I mean, unfortunately, they don't teach civics now like they used to, but, but uh, even then, they didn't used to like they did in the 19th century from the textbooks, the school books that I've been able to read, the old ones. But... You know, I, we studied the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, the Emancipation Proclamation, and Lincoln's Gettysburg Address and all that, you know, and had to memorize all that stuff. And, and, and I thought I understood America. And then about six, seven years ago, um, my wife and I bought a home in, in Vermont, the 150-year-old house in Montpelier, which is this little town of 9,000 people, which is the smallest capital city in the country, with the only without a McDonald's, in fact. And, and in fact, what's really, what's really a hoot, every year on the ballot, you know, when you go and vote, uh, maybe it's every other year, I don't, you know, it's a, I, I guess it is every other year. Anyhow, when you go and, you know, vote for mayor and all that stuff, um, on the ballot is, shall we uh, vote for another $54,000 to pay the legal fee for the lawyer to fight McDonald's for another year, you know? And, and, and the town votes to tax itself. To, to, it's, just, it's, just, it's just so cool, you know? It's just like... so, so anyhow, we bought this house, and, and uh, in the attic over the carriage house, there was this. Uh, there were these boxes of old, moldy, uh, rotty books. I mean, they they had been there literally since the 20s or 30s, and they were falling apart. And among them was a complete uh, set, 20 volume set of the collected writings of Thomas Jefferson, which was published in 1904, and containing some 17,000 letters of his, most of which were never had never been published before, and have never been published since. And I got hooked. I, you know, I, I started reading through these, and the books were falling apart in my hands. I eventually went on ABE books and you know, uh, eBay and whatnot and reacquired a collection of them, one book at a time. And then uh, Louise actually found a CD-ROM of them out there on the web. Um, so, you know, the National Archives have digitized so much of this stuff now. And, and, just, and, and I spent five years inside the mind of Thomas Jefferson, and, and, and what I discovered was completely unexpected. 
uh, both about him and about his contemporaries, because in all these letters you're, you're, you're learning about all the people that he was interacting with. And, and what I learned was that they, they had a, a clear understanding of the past that we have lost. And I think this, if, if there's nothing else that you take out of here tonight, that, that it is so important that you share with everybody you know, it is this clear understanding of how it was. From the beginning of human history, and, and tomorrow in the workshop we're going to talk about all the toxic stories that brought this about and how that happened, but, but just broadly speaking, from the beginning of what we call history, of course, it's not human history. It's the history of basically one tribe, the tribe that uses language, alphabets, technology, and agriculture. But, you know, and so it's about a 7,000-year history. It's not the history of the human race. But nonetheless, from, from when Gilgamesh first rose up and cut off the head of the forest god Humbuba and, 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 and cut down the cedars of Lebanon to build the giant city Uruk in, you know, 40 miles north of what's now Baghdad, um, from, and, and, wrote, and the Epic of Gilgamesh was written, you know, the oldest written uh, account, until 1776, or 1773, really, as they started, early 1770s, they started thinking about this. With, the, with this one little blip, with this one little exception of Greece, about a little more than 2,000, 2,300 years ago, um, which didn't quite work because it wasn't really Greece, it was Athens. It was an island, a city-state, and, and, and uh, so the rules were a little different. But, but basically, all that time, that 7,000 years, Everybody, they understood. Everybody, all, all humans in civilization, which they were committed to. I mean, after all, you know, they were, they were living in houses and had tea shops and boats and things, and they weren't giving that up. Um, that everybody who had lived in civilization had, had been governed by one of three historic tyrannies. There had been the warlord kings, and Jefferson talked about how the kings... Um, you know, in some communities, uh, Louise, Louise and I and our kids lived uh, in 86 for a year, 86, 87 in Germany. And, and there, there was a castle just, you know, in the, in the forest. I mean, a ruin. It hadn't been occupied since 9-11 and called Nordeck. And you could, you know, just walk back in the forest. And all of a sudden, here's this little castle. And it was maybe, you know, twice the size of this room. I mean, it wasn't a big castle, but there it was. And, and that what, the, what these kings would do is they would have continuous wars with other kings. And they'd like, you know, it would be like a deal, you know. And they were marry, intermarrying in the royal families and all this stuff. I mean, they're still doing that. And, and, and the, whole, the whole thing was to keep a low level of warfare going all the time. Because they knew that as long as they could maintain war... They could keep the people oppressed. They could keep the people terrified. They could keep the people helping them build bigger and bigger castles so that if those guys over there who we were having this low-level conflict with ever got really, really bad and came after us, we could all hide in the castle. And so warlord kings were the first of the, of the, of the, uh, of the uh, tyrannies. The second were theocrats. Uh, the, the Pope, uh, you know, standing up in, in 12, whatever it was, 12, I forget the year now, um, uh, in France, you know, saying, saying it's, it's, it's time to go on the Crusades. You know, let's, let's, let's go liberate Palestine. Let's go liberate uh, uh, Jerusalem. And, and uh, you know, people who ruled because they said God had told them to, to. And, in fact, even today, the coins, the British coins, have uh, letters on them that in Latin stand for uh, the queen rules by the grace of God, by the, by the blessing of God. By, in other words, God said it's okay. God gave uh, his permission. And so, it's, a, it's a God's idea. Right? And, and so, you know, very often theocracies and, and, and kingdoms were combined. And then there was this, this, third, this third form. And uh, this third form was, was uh, the system was called feudalism. And, and, and it was, uh, broadly speaking, ruled by the rich. And here's, here's something, again, one of those things that people don't think about very often. There are no dynasties left over from 1776. You know, they, they, they say that John Hancock was the richest man in America in 1776 when he signed the Declaration of Independence. One of the reasons that he, that he had the, uh, head, a price put on his head by, by King George, 500 pounds. And he signed his name very large, saying, you know, I'll, I'm going to sign it so large that the king can read it without his spectacles, you know, and, and double the price on my head. Uh, his net worth in today's dollars was probably somewhere in the neighborhood of between four and $600,000 in today's dollars. 
the first person in the United States in the 1700s to amass a fortune that was greater than a million of today's dollars was in the year 1790, long after the Revolution and after the Constitution. Um, so it, it, it wasn't... It wasn't it, it, they were very clear that feudalism was not a way that they wanted to go. The, the rule by the rich was not a way that they wanted to go. And, and Jefferson wrote repeatedly in his letters about the dangers of wealth to democracy. He didn't use the word democracy because back then it had a somewhat different meaning. It, it meant that Greek thing where 6,001 people had to show up to vote for anything and everybody understood that that was impractical. Um, but in any case, the, you know, broadly speaking, the, 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 this was you know, sort of a dangerous thing. That, and, and great wealth, and, and, and there are no dynasties left over from that time at all because they didn't allow it. They had inheritance taxes. They, 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 there, weren't, there weren't people of, of that great wealth. It just, it just wasn't allowed. So one of the first things that I, that I, that I discovered as I was, as I was doing the, 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 the research, as I, as I got into this, first of all, I, I, I called up uh, uh, my publisher, one of my publishers, Random House, and, who had published Last Hours of Ancient Sunlight. And I said, you know, I, I've, I've just, I'm learning all these amazing things about Jefferson. And, and I'd love to write a book about him. And, uh, you know, got a contract to write the book. And, and, and I had this other book, Unequal Protection, that, that also had, I had learned a lot. You know, it, it, in fact, it, it, that Unequal Protection had actually started out as the Jefferson book, and, and it went off on another direction. And then the Jeff, so they really, they were kind of two pieces of the same research. But anyhow, they said, fine, you know, go ahead and do that. And so one of the first things that I wanted to find out about was the Boston Tea Party because Jefferson kept referring to that little incident in Boston Harbor. The Boston Tea Party really, in 1773, was the beginning of the American Revolution. And and it was that crystallization of understanding about that third form of tyranny that they had. And so uh, I went looking for a good book in the Boston Tea Party, and I couldn't find one. There aren't any out there. There are like children's books, you know, about the Boston Tea Party and, you know, comic books and things and cartoons and whatnot, but I really couldn't find anything solid about it. And, and you know, looking and looking and looking, and finally in an antiqu- antiquarian bookstore, I found uh, a book that was published in 1824. See, the reason why, let me back up, the reason why there are no good books about the Boston Tea Party is because the people who participated in it, there were roughly 150 men who participated in the Boston Tea Party, all swore an absolute oath of silence because they knew what they were doing would put them under death sentence. They, were, they swore an absolute oath of silence that they would never reveal each other's names. In fact, the entire event was done in silence. Uh, uh, George Robert Twelve Tree Hughes, the chronicler of it, later wrote that that was the quietest night Boston had had that year. It was done. Com- <laughs> it was done completely in silence. And and so uh, we knew we knew that, John, that uh, uh, Sam Adams was there because he sort of bragged about it obliquely. But you know he never really revealed anybody's name. And and that was after the Revolution. And in 1824, when pretty much everybody else was dead, um, you know it was it was what 40 years later, 40 almost 50 years later. Um, George Robert Twelve Tree Hughes, who had been 17 years old at the time, pulled out his diaries from that time and, and uh, wrote this book, which was published in Oswego, New York in 1824 in one edition and was uh, available, you know, as far as I can tell, for, for maybe a year, and then it just kind of vanished. It's, it's, uh, and it was called A Retrospective of the... Of the uh, it's got this long, long title. I can't remember it now. It's a, like a 20-word title. You know, a retrospective of the little event at the, in the hot Boston Harbor when the tea got thrown in, also known as the Boston Tea Party, something like that, because uh, that's how they titled books back in those days. And so I spent um, a, a good chunk of the advance that I'd gotten for this book on getting this book because I wanted to find out what, what happened with the Boston Tea Party, what was going on with this thing. And it turned out the... the uh, the British East India Company had been chartered in 1601 by Queen Elizabeth I, and it was the first major corporation. And, and the, I had thought, you know, I had thought that I had learned that the Tea Act of 1773, three years before the Revolution, that happened that summer before the Boston Tea Party was in either late November or early December, it was in the winter of 1773, that the, that the Tea Act of 1773 which everybody said was taxation without representation, right? That was the thing that pushed them over the top, that that was a, a tax increase, right? That's what I had just kind of remembered from elementary school. 
And I'm reading George Hughes' books, and this, this old book that's, that's you know, hand-set type, you know, on uneven spaced pages and things. And, and he tells, really, a, a rather different story in it. And uh, uh, he says, uh, I'm, I'm quoting now from him. The East India Company, however, received permission to transport tea free of all duty from Great Britain to America, allowing it to wipe out its small competitors and take over the tea business in all of America. See, the East India Company was fixing to pull a Walmart. (laughs) Seriously. Hence, he said, it was no longer the small vessels of private merchants. See, tea was like the major drug of choice in the colonies back then. I mean, you know, it's a... Tea and, and uh, cider, and, and, and uh, cider, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, yeah, hard cider, thank you. Um, you know, we hadn't really developed a wine or a beer industry in the United States, and so they'd, they'd make hard cider, and especially in the winters and the northern climates, they'd freeze it, which would distill out the alcohol, you know, and it's a, those of you who live up north maybe know about that, but, or have lived up north, but in any case. Um, but there were little tea shops everywhere. I mean, every city block had a tea shop, and there were all these, just thousands of entrepreneurs all, all, all up and down the East Coast who were bringing this stuff in. And so here, I'm, I'm reading from Hughes, this, you know, written in 1824. Hence, he says, it was no longer the small vessels of private merchants who went to vend tea for their own account in the ports of the colonies, but on the contrary, ships of an enormous burthen that transported immense quantities of this commodity, which by the aid of... By the aid of the public authority might, as they supposed, easily be landed and amassed in suitable magazines. Uh, in other words, they were going to bring this stuff into port, right? Uh, accordingly, the company set its agents that bought the company, the East India Company, at Boston, New York, Philadelphia, 600 chests of tea and a proportionate number of Charles, to Charles. Now, this is because of the tax cut, right? They, they, they got a, a multi-million dollar tax cut on tea. In fact, not only did the British government give them a, a tax cut on the tea that they were sending to the United States, they gave them a three-year retroactive tax cut, sort of like you know, Enron, General Electric, and all these other companies that, that for the last four years paid no taxes at all you know, it's a, because of the changes in the tax code. Well, the, uh, the colonists uh, didn't think well of that, shall we say. And uh, the fellow by the name of Rusticus, uh, well, here, here again, uh, Hughes, he says, uh, uh, those opposers of the measure of the, uh, of the Tea Act uh, therefore uh, encouraged a strong resistance. Well, that's a bit of an understatement. Here, a fellow by the name of Rusticus, we still don't know who Rusticus was. There's, there's, it's, nobody knows for sure. He was a pamphleteer. He wrote these pamphleteers, and he stuck them up all over the place, all over Boston and and uh, some people have said it was Sam Adams, but, uh, but he, it doesn't seem he was quite that articulate. But it was, he was somebody close to him in any case. Um, this, this colony, it was called, uh, it's called the Alarm. Uh, one issue, here's one of the first issues. Are we in like manner to be given up to the disposal of the East India Company who now have the assurance to step forth in the aid of the minister, that being the representative of the British, to execute his plan of enslaving America? Now, keep in mind, the British East India Company didn't have any cannons. They were talking about economic enslavement. Their conduct in Asia for some years past has given simple proof how little they regard the laws of nature, the rights, liberties, or lives of men. Keep in mind, the East India Company ruled India. I mean, thus the East India Company, right? In fact, Thomas Yale went over to India on the behalf of the East India Company, made millions, came back, bought a little college named after himself, and uh, our president went there, actually. Um, (laughs) Anyhow, back to Rusticus. They have levied war, excited rebellions, dethroned lawful princes, and sacrificed millions for the sake of gain. Uh, A word they used back then, today we would say profit. The revenues of mighty kingdoms have centered in their coffers, and these not being sufficient to glut their avarice, they have by the most unparalleled barbarities, extortions, and monopolies stripped the miserable inhabitants of their property and reduced whole provinces provinces to indigence and ruin. 1,500,000, it is said, perished by famine in one year, not because the earth denied its fruits, but because this company and their servants engulfed all the necessities of life and set them at so high a price that the poor could not purchase them. So you can see the, uh, you know, they, they were a uh, little pissed off, shall we say. It's, 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 uh... But the tea arrived on the 28th of November, Hughes writes. The ship Dartmouth with 112 chests arrived. 
And the next morning, the following notice was widely circulated. Friends, brethren, countrymen, that worst of plagues, the detested tea, has arrived in the harbor. The hour of destruction of manly opposition to the machinations of tyranny stares you in the face. Every friend to his country, to himself, and to posterity is now called upon to meet in Faneuil Hall at 9 o'clock this day, at which time the bells will ring to make a united and successful resistance to this last, worst, and most destructive measure of administration. And they all, they all got together and, and you know, had this long argument about what they should do. And what came out of this ultimately was uh, somebody yelled a war whoop from the, from the balcony and off they went, and 150 of them, and they committed what was literally a, a million-dollar act of vandalism in the Boston Harbor, which most historians say was the beginning of the American Revolution. The, the, the British responded with the Boston Port Act, which said that until Boston paid back a million dollars to the East, East India Company, they were going to seal the ports, which then, you know, and just, it just escalated and escalated and escalated, and that was the beginning of the whole thing. So I was amazed to find that out, which was something that Jefferson had turned me on to. But the other thing that, that, that really um, uh, was, was, was a huge aha to me was the idea that... that his, in, the, in these three historic tyrannies, the premise had been that the warlord kings, the theocratic popes, and the, and the, and the, the, the wealthy feudal lords were the holders of the rights. And the people, we the people, had no rights. In fact, we were very often bought and sold, when, you know, particularly in the feudal times, with the land. People say, well, you know, 1215, King John, you know, the feudal lords, uh, they got King John to sign the Magna Carta. It was actually the high point of feudalism, not of rights for the average person. It was that was that was when feudal, feudal the feudal lords were so powerful, very much like they are today, that they could go to the to the to those who control the levers of government and say, "You will do it our way." You know, you will pass a Medicare bill that doesn't you know that guarantees our profits. You know that that sort of thing. I mean, basically, and 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 uh, so and so what. What Jefferson and Madison and Mason and Jay and Hamilton and Adams and all these guys and, 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 and many of the women around them as well, whose names are not as well known and are not, uh, you know, unfortunately, as, as, as much a part of our history, but nonetheless they were there, so, uh, had very clearly in, this, in, in, in mind was that, we were, that they were going to flip this thing upside down and say that the people now are going to be the ones with the rights and then whenever people get together and claim or, and create any kind of an institution, whether it's a, gover- whether it's a government, whether it's a, a, a corporation, whether it's a church, whether it's a civic group, no matter what it may be, whenever people get together and create any kind of institution, that institution will not have rights, it will only have privileges. Even when it's the government, it will only have privileges. Governments do not have rights. And they just absolutely... And, and so they came up with this idea, and the whole world was looking at this going, these guys are nuts. These guys are absolutely crazy. You know, in 1834, Alexis de Tocqueville came over here. It, this was, I mean, after the French Revolution and everything, you know. It's a, and still the world was convinced we were going to go down in flames. You know, when the Civil War happened, they, the, the whole world held its breath. Is this going to be the end of the experiment? The Tocqueville, Democracy in America, his book uh, was the best-selling book the first half of the 19th century. So, you know, more copies on a per capita basis than anything John Grisham ever would dream of. <laughs> and, 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 and in the book, basically, you know, he talks about isn't it interesting and all this kind of stuff, and the, but basically his conclusion is aristocracy is the most stable form of government, and, ver- and eventually America is going to have to become an aristocracy because democracy, you know, just doesn't work. If it worked, somebody would have thought of it more than 7,000 years ago. We got 7,000 years of aristocracy. What's this democracy nonsense? You know, that was basically the, the, the way the world was viewing it. Well, in the meantime, the so okay, so so they 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 came up with this idea. Let's flip this thing upside down. And in the process of flipping it upside down, they were, they were putting together this constitution in 1787. That, you know, after the war, the Revolutionary War was fought and won, and we'd been operating under the, under the Articles of Confederation, and they and they needed to put together something that was really going to going to be more a, a more effective way of administering a, a federal republic, a government. And one of the myths that is uh, really substantial on both the right and the left that you will hear from 
from historians' uh, uh, ideologues on both the right and the left, is that the people who put together the Constitution and the people within the states who ratified the Constitution were doing it because they wanted to protect the interests of wealthy white landowners and, and business people. And what's fascinating is that uh, a fellow by the name of McDowell uh, a few years ago, the, the, this idea first came about because Charles Beard in, 19, in 1928, 1929, wrote a book called The, History, the Rise of American Civilization. And Beard, uh, and, and he wrote another book called An Economic History of America, and in that he suggested that that was the whole thing, that this is what it was all about. And he just suggested, he just said it, you know, like this, this is what it was all about. And it had been just like accepted theory. And McDowell came along back about 15 years ago and actually went back through the records of who was there at the Constitutional Convention and who on a state-by-state basis voted for ratification of the Constitution. And what he found was that the vast majority, that there, that there were fewer than 30% of the people, both on the federal level and at every state, voted in their own economic self-interest. More than 70% of the people who, who voted to ratify the Constitution, to put the Constitution together and to ratify the Constitution in the states were voting against their own economic self-interests because they really and truly believed in a higher ideal. They, they really thought that there was something... That they, they, they were conscious of the fact that they were standing at the edge of history, that this was the, this extraordinary experiment that could not be allowed to fail. And um, in, in Unequal Protection, I don't so much get into that, but there's a whole chapter uh, in uh, What Would Jefferson Do that has all the detail, for, for those of you who are detail junkies, you know, that has all the, the state by state and all that stuff, you know, and all, all of McDowell's research in it. And, and uh, I thought it was just fascinating. So anyhow, the Constitution gets written. Thomas Jefferson is over in England, or in, over in France, rather. He's the U.S. envoy to France in 1787. And James Madison, who's his, his protege, his, uh, yeah, literally his protege. Madison sends him a copy of the Constitution. And Jefferson reads the thing through and, and, and uh, writes, Jeff, writes uh, uh, Madison back a letter saying, you know, this is very nice and I really like the division of powers and you know, all the, the fact that the president can't, doesn't have the authority to make war because that's the kingly oppression that has most often you know, uh, been destructive to, to uh, governments. And, and he points out a bunch of things that he really likes. And then he says, and now I will tell you what I do not like. He says, what I don't like is that this Constitution does not provide with, you know, with, even with the, with, in a clear and, unamb- I'm paraphrasing now, in a clear and unambiguous fashion, it does not state that the rights are held by the people and the government has only privileges. It doesn't state it. And Madison writes him back this long, eloquent letter in which he says, but... Uh, you know, kind sir. I mean, these guys were like best friends, but the the letters were all, you know, flowery and formal. Um, He says, but, you know, we all understand that. There's not a man in America uh, who doesn't understand that. Everybody in in America understands that the government doesn't have rights. It has only privileges. I mean, that's nowhere in the Constitution does it even imply that the government has rights. In fact, what the Constitution does is it limits the privileges of government. And Jefferson wrote him back saying, and again, I'm paraphrasing the, the actual languages and what would Jefferson do. Um, he wrote him back saying, essentially, uh, you and I know this. The people of our generation know this. But in generations to come, this, this, this obvious knowledge may be lost. And it is incumbent upon us as we stand at this edge of history, at this moment in the, in, as we create this new form of government that has never before existed, that we make it absolutely unambiguous that what we are doing is we are saying only the people have the rights and all other institutions, including government, have only privileges, that there are these two categories, rights and privileges, and the people are the sole holders of the rights. And then he goes through and says, and here are the specific rights that I think absolutely must be enumerated. And the list that he goes through essentially became the Bill of Rights, um, including the Ninth and Tenth Amendments, which say that any rights uh, not specifically enumerated in the Bill of Rights Nonetheless, doesn't mean that the government has those rights. You know, the, the, the people hold the rights, or the states hold the rights. In the case of the Ninth and Tenth Amendments, respectively. And and just an interesting aside, and this uh, 
Um, Jefferson, there were two, there were two constitutional amendments, two amendments to the kind see, the, these guys were all numerologists. They were all like really into numbers and things. Um, uh, they were, they were, you know, most of them were Masons. Uh, Jefferson apparently wasn't, but uh, many of them were. And, and they were all into the mystical stuff, you know. I mean, it was, in fact, back in those days, in order to become a physician, you had to be an astrologer, you know. It was like just a required thing. And, and um, so they were all, and, and 10 was a magical number, and so they were going to have 10 amendments to the Constitution. And uh, they ended up taking one of those Ten Amendments and dividing it into three. It became the Sixth, Seventh, and Eighth. The right to a speedy trial, the right to, have, to make bail, and the right to a trial by jury. Maybe I've got the order of the last two backwards, but in any case, speedy trial, yeah, trial by jury and make bail. Um, sixth, Seventh, and Eighth Amendment. That originally was one amendment, and there were two others that Jefferson had proposed that didn't make it. One of them was that Jefferson wanted to ban standing armies. He pointed out that in time of peace that there, should, there was no need to have a standing army. And in fact, when you looked at the history of the world, you saw that governments that had been overthrown had very often been overthrown by standing armies, by armies within their midst. And, and therefore, he said, we should have a navy because we've got a border to protect. And there were, bar, you know, the Barbary pirates and all that stuff, you know, and the, and the Spanish in the south and the French in the north. And there, were, there was, seemed like a good reason to have a navy. But he said, there should be no army. We don't want soldiers among us. And, and uh, the dialogue went back and forth, and, and, uh, and, and, and Madison's response was, well, what do we, how do we protect ourselves? And Jefferson says, every, every able-bodied man between the ages of 16 and 47 should be a member of the militia. And the militia should be organized at the local level, at the ward level, and the wards then would report to the counties, the counties would report to the states, the states would report to the federal government, and at each level there would be local control. And every person, would, every, every able-bodied man would have a gun in his home, and when the church bells ring a certain way, it means that we are under invasion, and every man would grab his gun, step out of his house, and boom, the entire nation is the army. And this, of course, is what they do in Switzerland. Right? And, and it's the reason why Hitler never invaded the Swiss. <laughs> seriously. Seriously. Well, you know, there were a few logistics problems, too. There were those mountains in the way. But, but, but he got over those mountains to get to France. I mean, you know, he, he, it didn't altogether stop him. But, but the Swiss are, you know, the Swiss, you know, what, eight, 800, 850 years? They've never been attacked. And, and, and Jefferson was aware of that. And he suggested a, a Swiss-style army. He said, we, should have, we, we must have a militia. And so he'd written this long thing that said there will be an absolute ban on standing armies. No standing army will be allowed during, during wartime. War can only be declared by an act of Congress. War, you know, war must be limited. There were all these provisions. And um, every person in America uh, must have or have access to a firearm so that they can be a member of the militia, all the able-bodied persons. That's, that's sort of like you know, the equivalent of the sheriff's badge, right? You've got the gun, right? And what got left after this went through three different committees over a year of debate was an amendment that said, in order to uh, maintain a well-regulated militia, the right to bear arms shall not be abridged. That's the Second Amendment. People say, well, the Second Amendment was to, so that we could overthrow the government if it ever got oppressive. No, come on. If that was true, you'd have the right to have nuclear weapons. Um, you'd, you'd have the right to a tank, you know. It was just a remnant of this thing. So anyhow, that was one of the two amendments that Jefferson... The Second Amendment that Jefferson proposed was a ban on commercial monopolies. And he said, you know, we just fought a war against the East India Company. The British were their agents. And, and uh, you know, this, this is something that, you know, we, we just cannot allow to happen. And again, Madison responds to him and says, well, you know, if, you know and, and in fact, they had all these specific uh, arguments that, that, that uh, a corporation should not, you know, they didn't want an, an East India Company to ever appear in the United States. A corporation so powerful that it could influence the government. A corporation so powerful that it could do like the East India Company had done with King George II and go to him and, and gone to him in, in 1773 and said, or maybe, I, maybe it was King George III by then, and say, uh, you have to give us a tax break so that we can make more profits. You know? uh, they, they never wanted that to happen. And so corporations were limited. Their lifespan, it, it, first of all, corporations could not be incorporated on a federal level. And even today, we have very few federal corporations. So Amtrak, uh, the Corporation for Public Broadcast, there, there are a handful of them. And they require an act of Congress to create. So it's just, they're very rare. 
states are the only places where corporations can be created. And the reason why was, was because these rules were in place. A corporation couldn't live longer than the lifespan of a, of a, the productive lifespan of a working person. In some states it was 20 years, in some states it was 30 years, in most states it was 40 years. In no state could a corporation last more than 40 years at, in, in the 1790s when the, when, the Const, when the Constitution was finally amended. Um, corporations could not own other corporations. They could not own stock in other corporations. Corporations could not do business in more than one area. They had to define one, one reason for doing business, and that was it, and that was all they could do. The first purpose that a corporation had to, to exist by was to, was to benefit the people. In its charter, it had to say, this corporation is established to, for the public good, to serve the public good, and to run a railroad. Right? In other, and, and every year, the, the uh, attorney general... And the Secretary of State, rather, of every state had to examine every corporation in the state and say, are these people actually doing this? Are they doing what they said? And, and so Madison says back to Jefferson, you know, we don't need a constitutional amendment to bar monopolies in commerce. I mean, it's, it's, this is the law of every state in the Union. This is redundant. Come on, if we keep doing this, you're going to end up with 35 things to amend the Constitution. We, at some point, we've got to stop. And, and, and Jefferson... Never really threw in the towel. He never accepted it. He actually, he, he, to his dying days, he was, he was outraged about this. But, it, you know, he didn't get it through. So, so they, they stretched out the, that one to make three and so that we could have ten amendments, but uh, th- that's what they got. Now, here's the interesting twist. Having, having shared all this with you, my father right now... Uh, has uh, mesothelioma. Mesothelioma is a form of lung cancer that's uh, real rapid and real deadly, and it's caused by asbestos. It's caused by exposure to asbestos. And um, when I was born, in fact, he, he, uh, he, was, he wanted to be a history professor, and he, dro- he had dropped out of college um, and went to work in a steel mill uh, in Grand Rapids, Michigan, uh, Alcoa, uh, aluminum and steel and uh, worked in what he described as a cloud of asbestos because this hot stuff would come out over these rollers of asbestos. You know. And uh, that was in 1951. Now, in 1934, the first paper was published indicating that asbestos caused mesothelioma. And the asbestos industry had covered this up um, very successfully. In the, in the 30s also was the first good, solid scientific paper published linking tobacco with lung cancer. Over the years, the tobacco companies and the asbestos companies have succeeded in, in essentially keeping this information from us by claiming that they had the rights of privacy, that they had a Fifth Amendment right not to incriminate themselves, that they had a Fourth Amendment right of privacy. How could this be? You know, how, how could this happen? Um, how can this happen in a democracy? One of the last year, Nike Corporation. Um, Nike Corporation had been running, uh, they had hired a PR firm, excuse me, they had hired a PR firm to, uh, to place letters to the editor in newspapers all over the country that looked like they were from local people saying, isn't it wonderful that Nike has cleaned up their sweatshop act, I'm going to go back to buying Nike, Nike shoes and whatnot. And... Um, there was a guy in, in Northern California, a fellow by the name of Mark Kasky, who was a runner, a consumer of Nike shoes. And Mark knew that this was, uh, a, to, to use Mark's word, a lie. And uh, so under, in California law, you can actually uh, sue a corporation on behalf of the attorney general. You can be your own attorney general. And so uh, Kasky sued uh, Nike. And then the lawsuit was Kasky versus Nike. And Nike, instead of saying... Oh, wow, we're sorry. Yes, we didn't get it quite right. Uh, We'll fix it. Uh, We actually will clean up our sweatshop back now. Instead, Nike said, we have the right to lie. We're a person. People have the right to lie. And, and, uh, you know, this, this, uh, they lost at the state Supreme Court, and they argued this all the way to the United States Supreme Court, to the federal Supreme Court. And the arguments were heard in April of this year. Back in the 70s, there was a, a whistleblower in a Dow Chemical factory who uh, indicated to OSHA, or, or to the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, the Dow was releasing uh, toxins into the air or water, excuse me, illegally, and 
pardon me. And um, so the EPA, an EPA inspector shows up at the door and says, uh, you know, hi, I'm here from the EPA. I'm here to do a surprise inspection. And the folks at Dow said, well, you can't come in. And well, why? Well, because we have a Fourth Amendment right of privacy. But, uh, you know, we're the EPA. I mean, we were created to do surprise inspections. Well, sorry, you know, we've got a right, Fourth Amendment right to privacy. And so, Dow, so the EPA hired a pilot with a private plane and flew over the factory and took pictures from the air and actually documented this discharge, right? And uh, so Dow sued the EPA for invasion of privacy. And it went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, well, if Dow is a person, then they have a Fourth Amendment right of privacy. And the EPA can no longer perform surprise inspections. Neither can the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. They can no longer just show up and say, well, are you, know, are you doing things that put people's lives at danger? Um, the Fifth Amendment, uh, the Fourteenth Amendment. The Fourteenth Amendment's a particular... Well, how did this happen? In fact, the Fourteenth Amendment, this is, this is where it all began. The Fourteenth Amendment, after the Civil War... See, I, the, the, the corporate history that I was giving you, how, how it was in America when there were no dynasties. And we had, and yeah, it was an imperfect democracy. Um, uh, women weren't voting. We had slavery. Uh, people, again, have this misconception that this was the idea of the founders and that this was in the Constitution. They say slavery is in the Constitution, um, that, that uh, African Americans were three-fifths of a person um, and, and that women couldn't vote. Number one, there were women who were voting in the 1780s, 1790s, 1800s, 1810, 1820, 1830. And number two, there were African Americans who were voting. Um, the, what, the, what the Constitution, the, the three-fifths thing in the Constitution was a compromise that they had to put in in order to get the southern states to come in because the southern states were saying, because, because they actually wrote into the Constitution, and this was at Jefferson's insistence. Jefferson, the, 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 the first case he ever took as a lawyer was defending a black man and, and saying that, that this man should not be held in slavery. Now, yes, he was a slaveholder. I mean, this is this, is this bizarre, you know, non sequitur that, that just, you know, is a very difficult one, I think, for many of us to understand. But, but uh, Jefferson, and I'll get to that in a second, but, but Jefferson argued that slavery must end by 1808. They had to, they, we, had to, we had to put an end point at this. I mean, there has to be a stopping point. There just absolutely has to be a stopping point. In fact, may I borrow that book for just a second? Thank you. I just, I just want to share a few of his words with you because it's just, it's just um, so remarkable. Um, yeah. In, in the April of 1770, Jefferson was practicing law and defended a slave who was requesting his freedom. The case was Howell versus Netherland. In his arguments on behalf of the slave, Jefferson said that under the laws of nature, all men are born free, and everyone comes into the world with the right of his own person, which includes the liberty of moving and using it at his own will. The year before, in 1769, when he had been elected to the House of Burgesses in Virginia, he had written a bill to abolish, abolish slavery in the state of Virginia. You know, he also wrote it into the Declaration of Independence, and John Adams made him take it back out again. I don't know if, you know, it's, it's, that's in a lot of civics classes, but a lot of people don't, are unaware of that. But... In any case, he tried to end slavery in his own state, in Virginia. And the, the, the fathers of Virginia punished him. They changed the law on slavery in Virginia so that if somebody freed a slave in Virginia, that freed slave could immediately be seized by anybody else in Virginia and made their slave. And so the only way you could free a slave was to take that slave outside the state of Virginia and buy them a farm and set them up on their own property in one of the non-slaveholding states, like Massachusetts or Vermont or New Hampshire. And, you know, these guys had a lot of land, but they didn't have a lot of money. Thomas Jefferson died broke. George Washington only had enough money to free about a third of his slaves. Uh, it's just, I mean, they just, you know, having money, having land back in those days, uh, you know, they were farmers. It's, 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 so, in any case... Uh, and, then, and then they really got Jefferson. Um, he, the second time he tried to end slavery in Virginia, they passed a law because by then the word was getting out. His wife had died about six years earlier, and his wife's half-sister, um, who shared a father and grandfather uh, with his wife, Sally Hemings, and who, uh, according to many folks in some, in some of the letters, looked startlingly like Sally Hemings. 
um, the word was out that you know this slave that Jefferson had, he was sleeping with her and he was producing children by her who looked just like him, and so, or, or looked somewhat like him. And, and in fact, in reading his letters, I, you know, we discovered that uh, two of these children, two of the girls, in, when, they be, when they reached teenage years, Jefferson took them up to New York and married them off as white, and they just vanished. Nobody knows whatever happened to them. But, but you know, of Sally's kids. But in any case, um, uh, Jefferson, uh, the, I, I mentioned the three-fifths argument. And he, he, so, oh, they, they punished him by, by passing a law that said that if a man, if a person, if a if a white person was found to have produced a child by a slave, then the woman would be taken by a local church parish for two years of hard Christian labor, and then put on the auction block for open slave, you know, for an open sale, and anybody could bid on her except her original owner. And uh, which some argue is why Jefferson never owned up to it, even though it was an open secret. But uh, Article 1, Section 9 of the Constitution, to this day reads, the migration or importation of such persons, that me- means Africans, uh, African, what we would call African Americans now, many of them were first-generation Africans at the time, of such persons as many of the states, as any of the states now existing shall think proper to admit, shall not be prohibited by the Congress prior to the year 1,808. In other words, 1808, that's it. That's, it's, it's prior to that, we can't stop it, but we are going to stop it after that. And, and uh, so, so toward the end, Jefferson, uh, here is 1820, the, the Missouri Compromise. This, this, this big battle is going on and uh, about slavery. Missouri and Maine were being admitted to the state. Maine was not a slave state, and Missouri wanted to be a slave state, and Jefferson was absolutely opposed to it. He didn't want there to be any more slave states. And uh, in 1820, John Holmes wrote, writes him a letter telling him about this, and on April 22nd, six years before his death, writing with a quill pen, his hands cramped by arthritis, Je- Jefferson candidly expressed his despair in his response to his old friend and colleague. In it, he foresaw the day when the nation would be torn across a geographical line He was seeing the Civil War over the issue of human beings being considered that kind of property, which was a euphemism back then for slavery. I thank you, dear Sir Jefferson wrote, for the copy you've been so kind as to send me of the letter to your constituents on the Missouri question. It is a perfect justification to them. I had for a long time ceased to read newspapers or pay any attention to public affairs, confident they were in good hands, and content to be a passenger in our bark to the shore from which I am not distant, knowing that he was close to dying. But this momentous question of slavery in Missouri, like a fire bell in the night, awakened and filled me with terror. I consider it at once the death knell of the Union. It is hushed indeed for the moment, but this is a reprieve only, not a final sentence. A geographical line coinciding with a marked principle, that being slavery, moral and political once conceived and held up to the angry passions of men, will never be obliterated, and every new irritation will mark it deeper. I say with conscious truth that there is not a man on earth who would sacrifice more than I would to relieve us from this heavy reproach in any practicable way. The the cessation of that kind of property, for it is so misnamed, is a bagatelle, a small issue, which would not cost me a second thought if in any way a general emancipation and extirpation could be effected. And gradually and with due sacrifices, I think it may be. But as it is, we have the wolf by the ears, and we can neither hold him nor safely let him go. Justice is on one scale and self-preservation on the other. A few months later, he receives a letter saying the Missouri Compromise went through. Missouri is going to be a slave state. Slavery has not ended. He thought it was going to end in 1808. He was president in 1808. He was in absolute despair over this. And he writes this letter. He writes this letter uh, back to Holmes again. He says, I regret that I am now to die in the belief that the useless sacrifice of themselves by the generation of 1776 to acquire self-government and happiness to their country is to be thrown away by the unwise and unworthy passions of their sons, and that my only consolation is to be that I will live not to weep over it. 
If they would but dispassionately weigh the blessings they will throw away against an abstract principle, that being slavery, another uh, euphemism for slavery, more likely to be affected by union than by scission, they would pause before they would perpetrate this act of suicide on themselves and of treason against the hopes of the world. So, uh, you know, I, I, it, it goes on, you know, and, and, the, and the point, in fact, I, uh, the point that I make in the book, and just to, to close up this little moment of slavery, and it's really a digression, but I, it's, it's, uh, it was... It, it, it just grabbed me. I mean, it was something that I had no idea of. I just thought this guy is just a hypocrite, and he's, you know, it's a... So I may, the, the, in the book, my, my note to you, I say, it's easy for us in this day and age to look back 200 years ago and criticize Jefferson for all of this. He used the cheap labor resource of his slaves to maintain his, his lifestyle and the consequence of the failure of his efforts to abolish slavery. And he did work at this consistently from his very first step in, to, his very, to his very last days. And the consequence of his failure to, to abolish slavery was a bloody civil war followed by a hundred years of legal apartheid. Although he rationalized his slaveholding by keeping them in a style that exceeded that of most poor whites of the day, both were grim by today's standards. It was nonetheless a rationalization of slavery. Jefferson's lifestyle was made possible by slave labor, and there is no other way to say it. Recognizing that fact, many Americans are righteously indignant and quick to judge him harshly. Yet how many of us today would free our slaves? I'm typing these words on a computer containing many parts made in countries where laborers are held with less freedom and in conditions worse than those of Jefferson's slaves. My rationalization is that no companies in America or any other developed nation make any of those components anymore, and without parts from China and Malaysia, I would have no computer, but it's just a rationalization and no less hypocritical than Jefferson's. Sitting here at the keyboard, I notice that the shirt I'm wearing is made by modern-day slaves and the the lamp that is lighting my room, the sun is just now beginning to rise, was manufactured in China where workers who try to organize are imprisoned. Since Levi Strauss just closed their last American jeans factory this year, odds are the pants I'm wearing were made in a slave-holding nation as well. I can rationalize all the products of distant slaves that I use. After all, I don't have to look into their faces as Jefferson did which may account for why biographer Fawn Brody notes that whenever Jefferson returned to Monticello from any trip, he brought gifts for his slaves, and his household ledgers show evidence that he smuggled significant sums to Sally Hemings over the years. But it's still just a rationalization. The stark reality is that we in America did not end slavery. We simply exported it. And it's so much... And it's so much more comfortable for us to criticize Jefferson for agonizing over but still using slave labor 200 years ago when we don't have to look into the faces of today's slaves who are toiling and dying at this very moment to maintain our lifestyles. So, so it's, it's, a very, you know, it's a very delicate thing, I mean, trying to understand that time from the viewpoint of those people. But, but let me get back to this, this issue. How is it that this vision that these people held, that they held so clearly, they, they understood so clearly that, that, that uh, you know, when, when Jefferson wrote in the Declaration of Independence, um, all men are created equal and, 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 and meant it, that we now have a situation where corporations have become equal to men. Well, in doing the research for originally this book, uh, which ultimately became the first edition of it, became Unequal Protection, I had read many people's books, you know, and, and, and about the history of corporate governance in the United States and in the world, and, and I kept coming across this thing about corporations are persons. And corporations became persons, well, there were two things. In, in the, during the Civil War, um, Abraham Lincoln uh, suspended many of these w- laws all around the states. In fact, he used federal mandates to do it, to override the state's laws, so that the corporations could get large enough to provide war material for the, for the war. I mean, he just saw this as a survival for the Union thing, and he was going to undo it afterwards, and he was assassinated and never had an opportunity to undo it. So, number one, you know, the things like a corporation can't live more than 40 years. A corporation can only do one thing. A corporation can't own stock in other corporations. Most of those were undone during the Civil War years. But then, after the Civil War, 
because you know, slavery is implicitly mentioned in the Constitution, it's essentially written into the Constitution, in order to get it out, there, see, there was the Civil Rights Act that was passed right after the Civil War that ended slavery theoretically, but it didn't. You know, it, did, it wasn't enough. So they had to amend the Constitution. They understood this. And so they wrote three amendments to the Constitution, the 13th and 14th and 15th Amendments to the Constitution, which, which specifically freed the slaves. And that was their only purpose. It was their sole purpose. And the 14th Amendment in particular, says, and let me just read you the entire language of the first section of the 14th Amendment. All persons born or naturalized in the United States. Now, first of all, to be born or naturalized, you have to be a human being, wouldn't you? To be born or to be naturalized? Okay. All persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person person within its jurisdiction, the equal protection of the laws. It's referred to as the Equal Protection Amendment. In other words, everybody has equal protection under the law. Well, historically, we had referred to corporations as artificial persons and human beings as natural persons. The corporations had to have some sort of personhood status so that they could pay taxes, they could hold property, uh, they could sue and be sued, things like that. So they were called artificial persons. This goes back to British common law, back to the 12th century. Uh, well, really, 15th century, arguably. But in any case, it goes way back. You notice that that paragraph that I just read you does not say natural persons. It says persons. And so in the, in the, in the 1870s, the railroads, which had become so large and powerful, they were like the Microsoft of their day. They were just huge. In fact, Ulysses S. Grant was brought down by the railroad bribery scandals. He, his own Republican Party wouldn't run him for a third term in office, even though he wanted to, because he, so, so many people in his administration had been, had been uh, outed uh, by, through these railroad bribery scandals, including a man by the name who had been the Assistant Secretary of State, a man by the name of Jan, John Chandler Bancroft Davis. Put that in your biocomputer. We'll come back to it in a minute. Um, that uh, you know, the railroads just were enormously powerful. And the railroads didn't like the fact that the states were trying to regulate their behavior. And so they started going before the Supreme Court and saying, hey, we're persons. And under the 14th Amendment, we have to have equal protection. So if we get taxed at one rate in Santa Clara County and another rate in Santa Ana County, that's illegal discrimination. The first time they did this was in 1872. The Supreme Court threw it out, laughed at them. He said, yeah, get out of here. Come on, give me a break. The, the, the uh, Justice Field, he said, that the one presiding purpose of the 14th Amendment is the freedom of an oppressed people. Right? I mean, it just, that's it. Well, you read the histories, and, and, and like David Corton's book, When Corporations Rule the World, um, not to specifically to pick on David, because he was echoing everybody else. I mean, this is just conventional wisdom. It's everywhere. Howard's in everybody, um, was saying, In 1886, after about 10 or 12 of these cases where the railroads had come before the Supreme Court and said, we're persons, and the courts kept saying, no, you're not, no, you're not, no, you're not. In 1886, the court finally said, okay, you're persons. And thus, in 1936, J.C. Penney was able to go uh, before the United States Supreme Court and sue the state of Florida because Florida had laws that that protected small local businesses from large out-of-state corporations and say, that's unlawful discrimination under the 14th Amendment. And in 1936, J.C. Penney versus the state of Florida, the court looked back at the 1886 case. 1886, the case was Santa Clara County versus Southern Pacific Railroad. They looked back at that case where the, the railroad had argued that the, the, the Santa Clara County was taxing its fence posts along its rights of way at a different rate than, the, than Santa Ana County was, and that was illegal because that was discrimination under the 14th Amendment. And they looked back and they said, well, if the court said that that was the case, that must be the case. And so that's why you can't stop a Walmart, right? because they claim discrimination, that they're a person. Dow Chemical, I told you the story. I told you the story of Nike. I've told you the story of the tobacco companies, the asbestos companies, how all this stuff. And they all, they all go back. In fact, in, in, 19, in 1978, Massachusetts had a law that said that if a corporation puts money into political advertising, it can only be for an issue that directly affects that corporation. And they have to disclose why they are saying it and how it will impact them. 
And the, the First National Bank of Boston put money into the campaign of a politician in the state of Massachusetts that had nothing to do with Boston, with, with their banking. I mean, it, ultimately it did, we all know. But, you know, it did. They, didn't, they didn't do it according to the law. And I believe his name was Frank Bellotti. I forget his first name. I think it was Frank. But anyhow, Bellotti was the name of the guy who was the Attorney General of Massachusetts. And in 1978, Bellotti sued the First National Bank of Boston. And the case is called, is called you know, uh, First National Bank of Boston versus Bellotti. Went before the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court in that case, and this is the case that kicked the door open. In 1978, this is what made it possible for Ronald Reagan to come to power the way he did with all this money from Bechtel and all these other folks in the oil industry and whatnot so that his first official act of office was taking down the solar collectors that Jimmy Carter put on top of the roof of the White House and basically turning the American governance over to the oil industry. The, what, what made this possible was this case, Bilotti versus Boston, versus First National Bank of Boston. And in that case, the court said, on a 5-4 to four decision, the court said, well... If uh, corporations are persons, as they said, as we said in 1886, then uh, I guess that uh, that uh, they have rights of free speech, and money equals speech, and that's the Boston versus Bellotti case, right? And and which has, you know, which is which is one of the things that has made the fine, McCain Feingold so impossible. McCain Feingold doesn't regulate corporations; it regulates politicians because politicians don't have rights. Corporations do somehow. Remember that category? Here's here's rights. It was people, and over here's privileges. Corporations, governments, churches, civics groups. Somehow, in 1886, the Supreme Court took just corporations, not nonprofit organizations, not churches, not just corporations, and plucked them out and put them over here with with us and gave them rights. This, this, and those giant, that giant club of the Bill of Rights that could be used to beat back government should have become oppressive. So, and, and interestingly, in the dissent in that case, the four justices who lost, who didn't think that the First National Bank should have the right to, to throw money into the political process, the lead dissent was written by Rehnquist, who we think of as a Neanderthal, right? And Rehnquist opens his dissent by saying, Back in 1886, this court, without the benefit of argument or public discussion, ruled that corporations are persons. And he goes on to say that he thinks it was a mistake. Right. Well, this is interesting. So I thought, well, I ought to read that case. So I went down to the... I, I, I just live six blocks from the Supreme Court building in Montpelier. I mean, it's a little teeny town, right? And so I went down to the Supreme Court building where they've got a law library that goes back to when Vermont was an independent republic. Vermont and Texas are the only two states that were republics before they joined the United States. And, and, uh, and uh, Paul Donovan, who's become a, a good friend, actually, we had dinner at his house a couple, months ago, a couple weeks ago. Um, Paul Donovan's the head librarian there, and I, I walked in, and I, I didn't know him at the time, and I said, uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking for that uh, 1886 case that I've read about, you know, where, you know, uh, uh, First National, or um, Santa Clara County versus Southern Pacific Railroad. And he says, oh, the one where corporations became persons. And I said, yeah, that's the one. I'd like to see that. <laughs> so, so he goes, and he goes through, and he finds all these old dusty books, you know, that literally were published in 1887, right, 1888. And he finds, you know, the United States reports, you know, from the 1886 August session, or October session, uh, pulls it, opens it up, and says, okay, here it is. Uh, here's the head note. That's a common commentary written by the clerk of the court, uh, but that's not, that's not the legal decision. Here's the decision, and it runs about 17, maybe 23 pages, something. I don't remember how many pages. It was in that neighborhood, you know, 20 pages more or less. And I'd had enough coffee in me that I was able to sit there and read that whole thing. And, and I'm reading this case, and it's about fence posts and whether or not the county tax assessor in, Cal in Santa Clara County, or the state tax assessor for the state of California had the right to determine the value of the fence posts on which property taxes would have to be paid by the railroad. And I'm reading along page after page about fence posts and precedents on fence posts and the county tax assessor and the state, and I get all the way to the end, and at the very end, the last paragraph says... And therefore, the court rules that the state tax assessor it rules in favor of the railroad because the state tax assessor has the legal right to determine the value of the fence post, not the county tax assessor. And then the last sentence says something to the effect of four other, five other arguments were made before this court, including one that addressed a constitutional issue, but the court does not need to address any of these because it's apparent to the court that the state tax assessor had the right to determine the value of the fence posts. And I'm looking at this going... Where the hell's the stuff about corporations being persons? You know, it's, 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 it's not in here. I, it's just, it's, and so I went over to Paul, and I said, Paul, I can't find this. I don't, I, you know, I'm, I'm uh, I, you know, it's just, I, I'm, you know. 
And he said, well, did you read the, did you read the, he says, I think it's the right case, you know, I'm pretty sure. And we looked at it and, yeah, it's the right case. And he says, you read the whole thing? I said, yeah, I read it. And he says, well, did you read the head note? And I said, no, I haven't, you know, what's a head note? And he says, well, a head note, it's a commentary. It's written by the court reporter. And, and it's sort of like, you know, it just summarizes the case. You know, legal students use it. You know, it's like a cheat sheet. It's like um, cliff notes. You know, it doesn't have any legal standing, but it's, it's the cliff notes. And so, so he flips back, and it's like the first page. It's like the page before the page, you know, and it's in bold type. And the first paragraph, the first sentence of the head note read, Corporations are persons under the 14th Amendment and, equal to, and, and entitled to equal protection under the law. And I'm like, whoa, what's this? You know? And he's like, well, that's the head note. And I said, well, it, you know, who wrote this? And he goes, well, let's see. John Chandler Bancroft Davis, he was the court reporter. Remember that name I told you to stick in your head? The assistant attorney, the assistant state, uh, secretary of state who got, turns out he'd also been uh, the president of the Newburgh and New York Railroad. But anyhow, he was the, he was the, he was the court reporter. So I paid my 73 cents, and I got a copy of this thing because the book was all kind of cracking and falling apart and whatnot, and Paul very carefully helped me copy it. And I, I took these down, I walked a couple blocks down the street and around the corner to Jim Ritvo's office. Jim is a lawyer and an old friend of mine, and he practices law in Montpelier. And I said, uh, Jim, I got something I want to show you here because um, I'd gone through and highlighted, you know, all the stuff about the fence posts and stuff, and that thing at the very end where it said that they didn't look at the constitutional issue. And I said, I'd like you to look at this. And he says, what is it? And I says, that 1886 case, Santa Clara County versus Southern Pacific Railroad. And Jim says, oh, you mean the one where corporations became persons? And I said, yeah, that, that one. <laughs> and, I, and I laid it all out on the table there, and I said, now look at this, and look at this, and look at this, and look at this. And he goes, oh, that's interesting. Well, that's interesting. That's interesting. I said, now look at the head note. And he goes, holy cow. Actually, it was a little more expletive than that. You know, <laughs> it's, it's, um, and I said, what is it? And he says, well, uh, he looks back again, and he looks back again, and he says, it's a mistake. And I said, a mistake? And he goes, yeah, it's a mistake. And I said, a mistake? You know, you're telling me that, 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 that the tobacco and asbestos companies are hiding behind a mistake? That the World Trade Organization is based on a mistake? You know, that, 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 that Walmart is rolling over communities all, all over America because of a mistake? And he goes, calm down, Tom, calm down. He says, these things happen. <laughs> So I don't get it, Jim. You know, what's what's the deal here? And he says, no, it's, he, says, uh, he says, I'm not a constitutional lawyer. You need to talk to somebody who's a constitutional lawyer. He says, but it sure looks to me like a mistake. People have been quoting the head note instead of the case. And I said, why would they do that? And he said, because people are lazy. <laughs> so he says, I said, who should I call? And he says, why don't you call Deb Markowitz? She'd probably know. And Deb Markowitz is our Secretary of State, and she's a lawyer, and she specializes in constitutional law. And, and a really decent person, and she's a Democrat, and I had a sign for her out in my, front, out in my yard for you know, the last election cycle, and I didn't know Deb, but one of the neat things about living in Vermont is you look in the yellow pages under Secretary of State, you, know, you get the phone number, you dial it, and hi, I'd like to talk to Deb Mark- This is Deb Markowitz. You know, so, um, <laughs> Deb, you don't know me, but I had a sign for you in my front yard you know, for during the, oh, that's nice, what do you want? <laughs> and... And I said, you know, it's, uh, I, I, wanted to, I wanted to talk to you about the 1886 Santa Clara County versus Southern Pacific Railroad case. And she says, oh, the one where corporations became persons. <laughs> and I said, yeah, let me tell you about this. And I told her what I found. And when I was all done, there was like this long silence. And I said, well, what do you think? And she said, holy, you know, it was, it was something very similar to what Jim said. And, and I said, what is it? And she said, well, she said, you know, clearly that wasn't the precedent. Clearly, there was some subterfuge there. She said, I, I, I don't know what it was. She said, that's not what I learned in law school. You know, I said, well, had you ever read the case? And she said, no, I don't think I know anybody who's ever read the case. I mean, you know, it was an 1886 case. You got enough problems reading the 1950 cases. You know, so. And I said, well, does that mean then that we can kind of throw out Walmart? And, you know, it's like, you know, uh, roll these things back and say, no, corporations don't have rights, you know, just the people. And she said, well, no, because, you know, in 1893, as I recall, there was a case where the Supreme Court cited the head note. And see, the Supreme Court can quote Daffy Duck. It doesn't matter who they quote. Once they've quoted somebody, that's the law. And so if the 1886 case didn't make the court the precedent, well, it turns out there's been 34 cases since then, including that one Boston versus Bellotti, where Rehnquist said this was a mistake. And Rehnquist hadn't read the case, right? He'd just read the head note. And uh, there had been 30, 34, 34 cases that have cited that case. So uh, the bottom line of this, 
By the way, this, there's, a, there's, a, there's an astounding irony about this. The, the bottom line of this is that the, the sickness that has infected our, our body politic, uh, the main sickness that has infected our body politic, is that the vision of the founders, this very, very clear vision, this unambiguous vision, that we, the people, would hold rights, that Madison said to Jefferson, you know, come on, everybody knows this, right? Nobody's ever going to forget that we, the people, hold the rights, and institutions that we create will have only privileges, except for corporations. That this, has, this is a, a fundamental usurpation of the, of the core principles of democracy. And that, and that we can rail about money in politics, and we can rail about corporate malfeasance, and we can rail about George Bush being in the pocket of Kenley and Enron, and on and on and on and on and on. But until this one pivot point isn't solved... Nothing else can change because this is the power that is being used to create these dynasties that have now taken so much control of our government. Now, how can this, how can this be done? How can this be done? What can we do about it? How can we, the people, take back America? The, there, there, are, there, are, there are a couple of ways that this could be addressed directly and, in fact, are being addressed directly right now. First, the first would be via the Supreme Court. Um, I, in, 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 17, in, in, 18, in 1874, I believe it was, was Roe v. Wade 1974? I think it was. 73, 73. okay, so it was 1873 because it was 100 years apart, which is a marvelous irony. 1873, thank you. Um, a woman by the name of Sarah Bradwell uh, went to, a few years before that, she went to law school. She got her lawyer's license. She showed up in a courtroom in Chicago to, to try a case. The judge looked down at her, pointed out to her that she was a woman. She informed him that she knew that. <laughs> he told her that he would not allow a woman to practice in his court and threw her out. And she sued. She sued him. She sued the state of, the, of Illinois took it all the way to the Supreme Court. It, the case was called Bradwell v. State in 1873. And in Bradwell v. State, the court ruled, and this is uh, Justice Bradley wrote the, the concurring opinion, which minced no words. The court ruled, and I quote, The family institution is repugnant to the idea of a woman adopting a distinct and independent career from that of her husband. So firmly fixed was this sentiment in the founders of the common law that it became a maxim of that system of jurisprudence that a woman has no legal existence separate from her husband or father who is regarded as her head and representative in the social state. In other words, Bradwell, in Bradwell versus State, Sarah Bradwell went before the Supreme Court and said, you know, women would like to have rights under the 14th Amendment, and the court said no. In fact, John Chandler Bancroft Davis wrote the headnote for the case in which he echoed that stuff. Well, that case got reversed in 1973 in Roe v. Wade. People think of Roe v. Wade was about abortion. Roe v. Wade was not about abortion. Abortion happened to be the MacGuffin, the pivot point, the turning point. But the real issue of Roe v. Wade was, is Bradwell versus State still the law? Do women have access to the Bill of Rights the same as men? Do they have a Fourth Amendment right of privacy the same as men do? And essentially what Roe v. Wade did was it overturned Bradwell v. State. So the Supreme Court has reversed itself on occasion. It has said, oops, made a mistake, we're going to change. Um, similarly, in 1896, there was a, a, a fellow by the name of uh, Ferguson, African-American. He was a, an, a, an activist, an abolitionist activist, uh, uh, who kept getting on, the, on this train down in Louisiana and, and uh, walking to the whites-only compartment in a, in a, in a, a railroad uh, uh, Cop by the name of Plessy, I, actually I may have the names reversed, I don't recall now, but anyhow, one, one or the other, uh, kept arresting him and throwing him off. He did it three times, and finally, you know, he dragged him off to jail, which is what he wanted. I mean, this was going to be a test case. Plessy versus Ferguson, and uh, in, uh, in 1896, and Plessy versus Ferguson made it, to the, made it to the Supreme Court, and in that case, again, here, now I'm reading from John Chandler Bancroft Davis from his headnote, in which he's paraphrasing the court. The object of the amendment, referring to the 14th Amendment, was undoubtedly to enforce the absolute equality of the two races before the law, but in the nature of things it could not have been intended to abolish distinctions based upon color 
or to enforce social as distinguished from political equality or a commingling of the two races upon terms unsatisfactory to either. So in, in, 19, in 1896, in the Plessy case, uh, we had established apartheid in the United States. Well, that got overturned in 1954 in Brown versus Board of Education. So we have this extraordinary irony that three times in the late 19th century, groups went before the Supreme Court and said, we'd like to be persons. Women did, and the court said, nope, sorry. African Americans did, and the court said, nope, sorry. And corporations did, and the court said, okay, no problem. (laughs) And now two of those cases have been overturned. And it's possible that the third could. The next president of the United States... Here's, here's what gives me hope about this. The next, there's two things. One, one, this has to do with why this is such an important year. The next president of the United States is going to appoint at least three members of the Supreme Court. You've got two that are in their 80s and one who has cancer. And, and uh, you know, R- Franklin Roosevelt, 1913, when the court ruled that, that, it, that it was unconstitutional for there to be minimum wage laws and, minim- and maximum hour work laws, um, Franklin Roosevelt came along and he said, I am going, and he said, right up front, He said it to the press. He said, I'm going to stack the court because these court rulings are not going to be allowed to stand. Court rulings that had forbid the the organization of labor. I mean, there's just a whole series of them. And he did. He stacked the court. Republicans still haven't forgiven him. (laughs) I'm serious. So, you know, as I said, the next president of the United States is going is going to is going to uh, have an opportunity to stack the court, and I guarantee you, it is going to go fully hardcore one way or the other. So that's number one, and and here's the the thing that actually even gives me a little bit of hope, when the Nike case now the, the Supreme Court, maybe once every thirty or forty years, the Supreme Court will go to the trouble of accepting a case. And then after having heard the arguments, decide not to decide. Right? I mean, they go through, there's a long process that they go through with all their, you know, assistants and associates and whatnot of li- listening to preliminary arguments and reading cases and am- amicus briefs and all this stuff before they even accept a case. So it's pretty much a done deal. If the court accepts a case, they're going to make a decision. I mean, the, the last time that they accepted a case and didn't make a decision was back in the 1930s. And so the, the Supreme Court accepted the Nike case back in, in 2003, the, the Mark Kasky versus, Kasky versus Nike. And uh, over 100 major corporations in the United States wrote amicus briefs, friend of the court briefs, in favor of Nike having the right to lie, including the New York Times Corporation, the corporation that owns the Washington Post, Gannett, the NBC, CBS, General Electric, AT&T, I mean, just the, a list of the who's who of corporate America, wrote amicus briefs, amicus briefs saying, corporations must have the right to lie. Without it, we're going to have social chaos and people running around in the streets and you know, all kinds of terrible things are going to happen. Right? <laughs> and Mark Kasky contacted a, a fellow out in Colorado, uh, Jeff, I'm having a senior moment. I'm forgetting Jeff's last name, and I, and I know him quite well. Anyhow, Jeff runs an organization um, called ReclaimDemocracy.org. And if anybody knows Jeff's last name, yell it out. But anyway. Um, and, and contacted Jeff and, a, and, a, and another lawyer, another Jeff, Jeff Cohen, and said, you know, let's write a, an, an amicus brief. And, and I participated in this peripherally. And we put together this brief. And our goal in this brief wasn't to say corporations shouldn't have the right to, to have free speech. I mean, that was part of it. But our main goal in this brief was to say to William Rehnquist, because we thought maybe this guy's actually on our side, based on, I mean, seriously, based on his dissent in the 1978 Boston versus Bellotti case, to tell him that he better go back and read the 1886 ruling rather than just reading the head note. Because in the meantime, when I was writing Unequal Protection, and I actually on my website, I've got a photocopy of this thing, we went through the personal papers of John Chandler Bancroft Davis that are in the National Archives that, from, judging from the dust on them, nobody had looked at since 1880. And we went, through, we went through his personal papers and found a handwritten letter to him from Morrison Remick Waite, who was the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court in 1886 and was dead a year later. And the head note wasn't published until a year after that, because back then it took two years for these things to get published. So the Chief Justice never knew that these words had been put in his mouth. 
and we found a handwritten note from the Chief Justice to the court reporter, the former Secretary of State in the railroad bribery scandals, and a handwritten note that said, in the, in the case of Santa Clara County versus Southern Pacific Railroad, we did not address the constitutional issue. Right? <laughs> Just saying it. Right? And so we wrote an amicus brief that said to Rehnquist, you were right in Boston versus Bilotti, and you didn't know half the story. And, and our hope was that this could be the case that would turn it. And what happened, was, we'll never know what happened, because the court, you know, you just, you just don't know what happened in the court in terms of internal discussion. But what happened was the court listened to the arguments in April. Both groups came forward, made their arguments. All these amicus briefs came in. They started reading them through. A hundred or more on the side of corporate personhood, of, of you know, corporations having the right to lie, Ours. <laughs> they read our brief. They said something to the effect of, uh-oh. And they decided not to rule on the case. They just said, we're not going to touch this thing. And, and, and threw it back to the, Supreme, the California Supreme Court, which had already ruled against Nike. It ended up being settled out of court. So that gives me some hope. So one way this could be reversed is by the Supreme Court, and, and that's an issue. And, and again, the Supreme Court doesn't lead public opinion. The Roe v. Wade didn't come about all of a sudden because the justices of the Supreme Court decided that they were going to overturn Bradwell v. State and give women access to the Bill of Rights. It came about because of the women's rights movement. Um, Plessy v. Ferguson in 1954 didn't come about you know, because the court suddenly decided that we should be a colorblind society. It came about because of the civil rights movement. And so there is a growing anti-corporate personhood movement in the United States, a, a movement to say human rights are for humans. And, 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 and it is... The, the city of Point Arena, California, has passed a resolution saying, in our community, we believe only corporations should have rights. Ten towns in Pennsylvania have now passed laws saying that in our towns, corporations do not have rights. Um, the the uh, Green Party has been pushing this very heavily in Arizona. They almost got it on the ballot last time around for a statewide referendum. Um, there, there's activity. The Greens, in particular, are pushing this activity all across the United States. This is something that we need to be infiltrating the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, the Greens, the everything, get politically active and, and need to be focusing on this issue because the Supreme Court does respond to public pressure and awareness. So number one, one way to do it is, is the Supreme Court. The second way to do it would be legislatively, and that is if we could get enough legislators to say, you know, the, the only way we're going to fix campaign finance, the only way we're going to fix the problems of money and government, the only way we're going to fix all these other problems, the only way we're going to successfully take back America is to, is, to only ha is to go back to the idea that the founders of this country had and that was essentially the law in the United States until the Civil War that only human beings have rights and that all of, our, all of the institutions that human beings create have only privileges. And the way to do that is to amend the 14th Amendment to insert the word natural before the word persons. And, and, and there is a movement to make that happen, and, and Reclaim Democracy is working on that. The Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, which has two Nobel Prize winners, the, old, the oldest and most prestigious women's rights movement uh, organization in the United States, two Nobel Prize winners as its past, president, past presidents, including Jane Addams. The Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, WILPF.org, has declared a three-year campaign to abolish corporate personhood. I have their bumper sticker on the back of my car. It says, Abolish Corporate Personhood, and it's got their address on the bottom. You'll find all these links off my website. If you go to the Unequal Protection, there's a whole website built around this, quotes from presidents about this and all, all kinds of stuff. Um, see, the, 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 because the, what they're trying to do is they're trying to go back to the laws as they used to be. I mean, this, this for example, I'll just read to you. This, is, this, is, this was a law in the state of Wisconsin. This is just representative. Every state had these laws that has since been repealed. See, what's happened is not only would we have to amend the, the, the 14th Amendment and put the word natural before the word person, but all the states now have amended their constitutions within just most of them within the last 40 years. There's been this huge movement on the part of corporate lawyers to make this happen. They have amended their constitutions to include corporations under the definition of persons. And in this book are all of the, the, the amendments, state by state, that would have to be done. Colorado, Connecticut, 
Florida, District of Columbia, Georgia, and so forth. So, and it's all, by the way, you don't have to buy the book. It's on the internet. You can download it for free. It's, I put the whole thing up there, all the, the, the amendments. But anyhow, this law, this, this is just characteristic of the laws that we could once again have in the United States and that ruled this nation. This is, uh, this is a Wisconsin statute. Uh, it's to, the title of it is Political Cor- uh, Contributions by Corporations. No corporation doing the in business in this state shall pay or contribute or offer, to cons- or offer consent or agree or pay to pay or contribute directly or indirectly any money, property, free service of its officers or employees or thing of value of, uh, to any political party, organization, committee, or individual for any political purpose whatsoever or for the purpose of influencing legislation of any kind or to promote or defeat the candidacy of any person for nomination, appointment, or election to any political office. Then under penalty, it says, any officer, employee, agent, or attorney, or other representative of any corporation acting for and in behalf of such corporation who shall violate this act shall be punished upon conviction by a fine of not less than 100 nor more than $5,000, which was big money back then, by the way, or by imprisonment in the state prison for a period of not less than one nor more than five years, or by both. And if the corporation... And if the corporation shall be subject to a penalty, then by forfeiture in double the amount of any fine, and if a domestic corporation, it shall be dissolved. If a foreign or non-resident corporation, its right to do business in this state is declared forfeit. Right? So, you know, that's, that's a way of, of going about it and, and, and is, is changing the laws. And frankly, I think what we need to be doing is we need to be working on all of these things. We need to be... <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm not quite used to your altitude here yet. We need to be, we need to be working on all of these things. I mean, it's just, it's just such a very, very, very straightforward process. And if we were to do this, I believe that, that one of the things... You know, people talk about the malaise in our economy, the sluggishness in our economy, and all this kind of thing. What's holding our economy back is exactly what Jefferson described, monopolies in commerce. I remember, I mean, in the, in the 60s, in, in 68, I hitchhiked across the United States. Every town was different. All the little, all, every, little, you know, every little business was owned by somebody who lived in that community. If, if you spend a dollar with a local business, it becomes a dollar fifty within a year, dollar seventy within a year. If you spend a dollar at McDonald's, you know, at the end of the or at Walmart, at the end of the night, the button gets pushed and the money gets sucked off to Chicago or Bentonville, Texas, or Arkansas rather, and and you know maybe seventeen cents will come back in the form of taxes and wages, but it's not getting recycled. Um, the 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 oppressive the oppressor of not just our rights, we the people's rights. I mean, 83% of Americans want national health care. Single-payer health care, as Dennis Kucinich so eloquently pointed out, is cheaper than the system we have right now. We could insure every single person. We did this in Vermont, by the way, with all our kids, Dr. Dinosaur Program. We have a single-payer health care system. You know, Howard Dean was running around talking about it. He, he's the one who pushed it through. We could insure every single person in the United States for less than the cost of what we're spending right now on health care if we simply took the health insurance companies out of the equation. Of course, Bill Frist's family wouldn't get rich, but, you know, get them out of the, out of the equation because they're sucking this. So, you know, it's so what is, what is holding down our economy is this fundamental lack of, of competition. You know, the conservatives are right when they say competition's a good thing. Where they're wrong is thinking that, you know, one media giant against another media giant is competition. It's not. That's nuts. That's, that's you know, a couple of monopolies having a friendship. So, so we, where we're at is this very, very fundamental time and issue, and the and the and the and the and the issue is a very clear one, and that is that the that the the ugly heads of kingdom of of rule by warlords have have risen their ugly heads again, and some of you have read read the I'm not you know we're getting tight enough on time here. I'm not going to recite the whole thing, but you know the parallels between what happened in Germany in the 30s and what happened here, you know, where a leader uh, took the, the, the bombing of a major building and said this was a sign from God and declared a war against terrorism and the Middle Eastern people who spawned it and blah 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 um, it, But it, it's the, this is the warning that Jefferson and Madison were so worried about, about a, a president using the power of war. So we're seeing the warlords rise again. I'm a war president. We're seeing the warlords rise again. 
We're seeing the theocrats rise again. There's this huge movement in the United States to claim that the founders were, were all good Christians, quote, end quote, and when, when in fact, I mean, many of them thought, many of them were Christians. Many of them thought Jesus was a brilliant philosopher. Many of them were deists. Some of them were atheists. There's a whole spectrum. But even the most fervent among, of the Christians among them, uh, you know, James Madison, for example, is one of the few who wasn't a deist, who was in that kind of in crowd with, with Jefferson. And James Madison, when he became president of the United States, a bill came before Congress to, to uh, give money from Congress to churches to care for the poor. And he vetoed it. And he has this long, and this is in what would Jefferson do, he's got this long rant in his veto about, you know, this, the, we are, we are, this, gov, this government should never surrender its, its authority and its powers to churches. We, they, there has to be an absolute barrier between the two. He was, he was totally opposed to faith-based initiatives. He said, this is an absolute abrogate, this is, this is the beginning going down the road of theocracy. And, we, and that's one of those three tyrannies, and we cannot allow it to stand. And we're seeing the third, we're seeing the third tyranny, the tyranny of, 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 the, of feudalism, only the new feudal lords, instead of being the ancient baronial landowners of Europe, are corporations. We're seeing the new, the new tyranny of feudalism arising. And, all, and, the, and the linchpin of these things, of all three of these, ultimately is that, that we, the people, have in some cases surrendered in some cases, not even realized we had, and in some cases had torn from us our rights. Our rights. And, and the, the key to bringing this all together, to taking this all back, is for us to reclaim our rights. We are at that moment of time that is so similar to what Thomas Paine wrote about in 1775 when he stood before the courthouse in Philadelphia and read the first issue of uh, what later was called Common Sense. The first issue was called The Crisis, his, his newsletter. And he wrote, These are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will now no doubt shrink from the service of his country. But tyranny, like hell, is not easily conquered. We're facing a new tyranny. It's the tyranny of the, of the would-be theocrats, the tyranny of the would-be warlords, and the tyranny of the would-be feudal lords. And it is up to us to turn it back, to, to, to throw them out, and to take back America, to take back our rights. Thank you. Let me add just one thing, if I may. If I, if I may just add one thing. Change in the United States has never happened from the top down. Never, ever, ever. No president has ever, even Abe Lincoln, no president has ever woken up and gone, geez, things are really going wrong. I'm going to fix them. It always happens from the bottom up. That's us. You are the ones with the power. We are the ones with the power. We are the ones who produce the change. Thank you. What do, uh, why do corporations have more rights? He says, this is yes. great. This is, oh, Jeff? Yeah. Jeff Milchin is his name. Yeah, yeah great. Oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> ReclaimDemocracy.org. There's several hundred of these. Oh, there's several hundred of them out there? Oh, wonderful. Cool. And, and there's POCLAD, the pro, pro, Program on Corporations, Law, and Democracy, is working on this, and Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, and Ronnie Duggar's organization. So anyhow, I just wanted to say that. We're, you guys are the ones with the power, and, 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 and if we fail to exercise it, well, we just can't. We just can't. We have to exercise that power. Book Thanks. Sign. Book sign. Okay. <laughs> Good night. I'll be sitting out here signing books. If you have questions or you want to say hi or anything, feel free. <laughs>